The great Maya Angelou, who was herself no stranger to fame, wrote that ultimately people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but that no one will ever forget how you made them feel. As applied to Muhammad Ali, the march of time may one day diminish his boasts and his poetry, maybe even his butterflies and bees. It may even one day dull the memories of the thriller in Manila and the rumble in the jungle. But I doubt any of us will ever forget how Muhammad Ali made us feel. And I'm not talking about how proud he made you feel with his exploits or how special he made you feel when you were privileged enough to be in his company. I'm talking about how he gripped our hearts and our souls and our conscience and made our fights his fights for decades. People like me, who were once young, semi-gifted, and black, will never forget what he freed within us. Some of us, like him, took pride in being black, bold, and brash. And because we were so unapologetic, we were, in the eyes of many, way too uppity. We were way too arrogant. Yet we reveled in being like him. By stretching society's boundaries as he did, he gave us levels of strength and courage we didn't even know we had. But Ali's impact was not limited to those of a certain race or of a certain religion or of a certain mindset. The greatness of this man for the ages was that he was, in fact, a man for all ages. Has any man ever scripted a greater art to his life? What does it say of a man, any man, that he can go from being viewed as one of his country's most polarizing figures to arguably it's most beloved. And to do so without changing his nature or for a second compromising his principles. Yeah, you know, there were great causes, there were great national movements, there were huge divisions that afforded Ali unusual opportunities to symbolize our struggles. But Harry Truman had it right when he said men make history and not the other way around. Or as Lauren Hill so nicely put it, consequence is no coincidence. Befitting his stature as the goat, Muhammad Ali never shied away from a fight. He fought not just the biggest and baddest men of his day inside the ropes, but outside the ring, he also went toe-to-toe -to -toe with an array of critics, a seemingly endless succession of societal norms, the architects of a vile, immoral war, the U.S. government. He even fought, ultimately to his detriment, the limitations of father time. Strictly speaking, fighting is what he did. But he broadened that definition by sharing his struggles with us and by viewing our struggles as his. And so it was that at various times he accepted and led battles on behalf of his race, in support of his generation, in defense of his religious beliefs, and ultimately, in spite of his disease. 
I happen to have been overseas working in Norway this past week. My buddy Matt called, told me the champ had been taken to the hospital. At this time, it was really serious. Right away, I called Lonnie, who was, as always, a pillar of strength. And as we discussed the medical details, the doctor's views, and the ugly realities of mortality, Lonnie said, Bryant, the world still needs him. And indeed it does. The world needs a champion who always worked to bridge the economic and social divides that threaten a nation that he dearly loved. The world needs a champion that always symbolized the best of Islam to offset the hatred born of fear. And the world needs a champion who believed in fairness and inclusion for all. Hating people because of their color is wrong, Ali said. And it doesn't matter which color does the hating. It's just plain wrong. Yeah, we do need Muhammad Ali now. We need the strength and the hope, the compassion and the conviction that he always demonstrated. But this time, our beloved champion is down. And for once, he'll not get up. Not this time. Not ever again. Let me close with a quick personal story. Fifty years ago, Muhammad Ali defeated George Chavalo in Toronto, Canada. The very next day, he showed up in my Hyde Park neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. As Ali got out of a car in the driveway at the home of Elijah Muhammad, I happened to be next door, shooting hoops in a friend's backyard. I, of course, quickly ran to the fence, and for the first time in my life, I shook the champ's hand. I was 17, I was awestruck, and man, I thought he was the greatest. Now, half a century, and a lifetime of experiences later, I am still awestruck. And I'm convinced more than ever that Muhammad Ali is the greatest. To be standing here by virtue of his and Lonnie's request, it's mine now. The honor that Ali has done me today as he goes to his grave is one that I will take to mine. God bless you, Jim.